uh, we are recording as of now clear darwaza band kar bhai bahar kitni awaazein aa rahi hain hi uh, my name is claire i am an sc4 um, histopathology trainee at st thomas's and um, our first cytology case today is an ebus tbna um so that stands for endobronchial ultrasound guided transbronchial needle aspiration and this is a procedure that is performed regularly in the ebus clinic in this hospital um along with our colleagues in the respiratory clinical team um and this is a technique that enables a rapid on site assessment of lung masses mediastinal masses and lymph nodes that are adjacent to the bronchial tree Oh. All right. Now let's try doing that one. Great. Yeah. And now I think you should be able to use that. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks. Um so the patient in this case was uh, a 27-year-old woman with a 3-month history of fatigue and night sweats. Um chest x-ray showed enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes uh, which were confirmed on CT and two of the suspicious nodes were sampled by endobronchial needle aspiration. So as you can see in the diagram on the right um this involves passing a bronchoscope down the patient's airway and inserting a needle into the targeted lymph node by the bronchial wall and the lymph nodes sampled in this case were station 4L and station 7 which as you can see in the diagram are quite close to the bronchial tree and easily accessible at ebus so a direct spread mgg preparation was then made and assessed in the ebus clinic um while the patient was still under sedation So this is the low power appearance and the impression is of quite a mixed cell population with small lymphocytes and mixed inflammatory cells and because the sample has been taken through the bronchus we might also see benign bronchial epithelial cells in this sort of case um but there aren't any in these fields of view um there's quite a clean background no necrosis um and there are several large cells which seem to stand out against the background some of which are singly dispersed and others are forming small groups so if we look at these cells on slightly higher power we can see they have a high nc ratio um so compared to a background red blood cell they're at least 5 or 6 times the size of these um and on higher power again we can see the nuclei have quite irregular outlines and macronuclei um and many have multiple nuclei as well and the cells also have quite abundant cytoplasm so these cells are mononuclear but if we look around at high power there are also a few cells that are binucleated or multinucleated um such as these that we can see here uh, but they have the same large nuclei macronuclei and abundant cytoplasm so in the context of the features we've seen so far in the mgg preparation what is your working diagnosis So at this point I should be able to launch the poll um which is going to come up when I hover around the screen above or below Oh here we go so right polling and 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 launch poll so your choices are coming up now and so you can start voting we'll give it a few seconds and then i will end the poll and then i will share the results with you okay so yep you're still going about 765% of the audience has voted already but we'll give everybody else chance to uh make their minds up and okay well two thirds of you have voted now so i'm going to close the poll if that's all right and so the poll is now ended and i'm going to just share the results with you okay so um most people have gone with a working diagnosis of hodgkin lymphoma um close that okay. um and it's important to have a working diagnosis uh, to determine the next step so we have another another poll question here 
So um, we've got some options what to do next at rapid on-site assessment, and we can request um, a dedicated needle pass, which involves using a wider bore needle to take more tissue, um, and we can perform either cell block or send us to flow cytometry. If an infectious etiology is suspected, we can send needle washings to microbiology, or we can take no further action. So what would be your preferred next step in this situation? Okay, so the second polling question has now been launched. There's some hectic voting going on there now by the 200 plus mm -hmm. attendees. We wait till we get to at least a two thirds majority, trying to be democratic here. Uh, let's see where we get to. Okay, 65, 66 and going. So we'll give it another couple of ticks. All right. I think we have an opinion. I'm now ending the poll. Thank you all for voting. And I'm now going to share the results of the poll with you. Claire. Okay, brilliant. So the majority of people have gone for um, cell block and immunohistochemistry with a significant portion. Also, I'm um, thinking maybe flow cytometry. So we'll talk about that a bit later. Yep. I can just... Um, so a pap-stained alcohol fix slide will also be prepared and this is available after the eBus clinic. So at low power, the pap stain shows similar appearances of a mixed inflammatory background with neutrophils, eosinophils, and the image on the right shows a non-necrotizing granuloma. And the pap stain also allows a more detailed assessment of nuclear features. Um, including chromatin quality and nuclear membrane irregularity. So the images at the top show some more mononuclear cells similar to the one seen earlier. Um, on the bottom left, there are a couple of very polylobated nuclei and there is a large multinucleated cell on the bottom right. So let's look at the cell block. So at low power, there's plenty of material in the cell block. And higher power shows some of the um, similar cells of interest. And on h and &E, we can see a little bit of margination of chromatin around some of the large nuclei, creating a slightly paler area around the nucleolus. These are some more of the uh, cells of interest. So immunohistochemistry. CD20 is staining some background B cells, but is negative in the large cells. Um, CD79A shows a similar staining pattern with uh, background B lymphocytes picking it up, but um, negativity in the large cells. CD3 is staining numerous um, small T lymphocytes in the background, and it can be a little difficult to assess uh, what's going on in the large cells, but I think we can appreciate that they lack the very crisp membranous staining that we see in the small background cells. So CD3 is negative in this case. Um, CD45 is also negative, and it's easiest to appreciate this where we see two of the large cells um, adjacent to each other, and we can see lack of membrane staining as a gap between the two cells. Um, CD30 shows strong membranous positivity with some accentuation around the Golgi area, and CD15 shows similar appearances to CD30. Um, PAX5 uh, strongly stains some background B cells and shows weak positivity in the nuclei of the cells of interest, um, while conversely MUM1 strongly stains the large cells and shows some pale staining in background activated T lymphocytes. ALK and EMA are both negative and EBA in situ hybridization is also negative. So um, given these features on the cytology cell block and immunohistochemistry, what is your diagnosis? Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, need to stop sharing the previous poll and launch poll number three. And so here come your options now. You can get clicking. Oh, great. Okay, here we go. Excellent. Good, keep going. We're nearly up to the 60% rate. 
voting mark. Give it another few seconds. Sorry, good. Go on, go for it. We're nearly there, two thirds. <laughs> All right, I think we'll have to close the poll now and I will share the results with you and with Claire. Okay, so um, the vast majority have gone for classical Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which is the correct diagnosis in this case. Um, so all of these options are reasonable differentials based on cytology, um, but with the um, immunohistochemistry, um, we should be able to rule out the other differential diagnoses. So um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, for example, often ALK positive, but may also be ALK negative. Um, but the cells in this case were negative for CD2 and CD3. Um, so that rules out that option. Um, also lack of expression of B cell markers should rule out options two, three, and four. Um, EBA is negative, so it's not infectious mononucleosis, and non-lymphoid neoplasms would not express lymphoid markers. And the, also the immunoprofile is not correct either for nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, yep, so the diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma, which is split into four subtypes, which vary in terms of their EBV association, the site of lymph node involvement, um, prognosis and whether bone marrow or visceral organs are involved. Um, however, subtyping on cytology is not considered accurate and is not routinely performed. Reed Sternberg and Hodgkin cells are present throughout all the subtypes and have the same immunophenotype. So detection of these enables a diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma and subtyping can be formed subsequently on histology. So this slide is just showing some of the variable appearances of neoplastic cells in classical Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, the three on the left can be appreciated on cytology. So the binucleate uh, Reed Sternberg cells, also described as having an owl eye appearance. Um, Hodgkin cells, which can be mononuclear or multinucleated. And then lacuna cells can only be appreciated on formalin fixed section, as the empty space around the nucleus is a result of retraction artifact. Mummified cells are apoptotic large neoplastic cells and are also best seen on h &E. So this is just a summary of the immunoprofile that we saw earlier in this case. So Reed Sternberg Hodgkin cells should be CD45 negative. They are generally negative for CD20, although sometimes this may be aberrantly expressed, but CD79A is invariably negative. Um, T cell marker is also usually negative, but may be aberrantly expressed and ALK and EMA should be negative. Um, CD30 is one of the most helpful stains in this diagnosis as the vast majority show a characteristic membranous staining with accentuation in the Golgi area. Um, CD15 is also helpful but is less consistently positive than CD30. PAX5 shows a very characteristic weak nuclear staining in contrast to the strong nuclear staining of normal B cells and MUM1 should be strongly positive in the nucleus EVA in situ hybridization is often positive, um, but was not in this case. So um, just to summarize, classical Hodgkin lymphoma um, can be diagnosed accurately at rapid onside assessment, and this can lead to early referral. Um, but compared to other lymphomas, there is a relatively high false negative uh, rate on cytology. And this is for many reasons. So um, lymph nodes are often sclerotic and so may yield a very hypocellular sample. <laughs> okay, that is the ultimate nightmare. <laughs> it is just a test alarm, so hopefully it will uh, quiet out after three goes. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so, sub so a very sclerotic lymph node may yield a hypocellular sample, which should be suspicious if it is not in keeping with the size of the lymph node. Um, also, the inflammatory cells that we usually see can completely obscure the neoplastic cells, or they might be falsely reassuring that there is an inflammatory process going on. Um, also, the lymph node may only be partially involved by disease. Uh, flow cytometry will not provide useful information in this diagnosis, as the neoplastic cells represent less than 1% of the overall cell population. And finally, just keeping all this in mind, 
if there is ongoing clinical suspicion in the context of an equivocal or negative cytology sample, um, biopsy and histological assessment is strongly recommended. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, I'm hoping Irina will be able to answer <laughs> that. <one. laughs> all standing right behind you here, Claire. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Claire. That was very interesting. Um, I do have one question, but I think you may have actually answered that um, in that the question was if it was suspicion of lymphoma from MGG, why didn't you ask for flow cytometry? So I think that's actually been answered. Are there any other questions? Are there any in the, the chat? Oh, yeah. Would yeah. I... Can the treatment be started on cytology results? So right, we have our uh, hematopathology <laughs> expert right next to us, Dr. Yurina Miki, to answer that very relevant question. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Yurina. I'm one of the consultant hematopathologists here. Um, first of all, thank you, Claire, for that excellent presentation. Um, so just to, um, so in answer to your question, yes, um, often sometimes the lymph nodes that have been sampled via EBUS are those are, are the only ones that are actually um, present and often are only able to be accessed by EBUS. So I would make a diagnosis as long as the morphological and immunophenotypic features are uh, fit, I would uh, make a diagnosis of classical Hodgkin lymphoma and treatment can be initiated. Um, the subtyping, although um, is more difficult on cytology, it won't affect um, sort of uh, the treatment. So yes, they would start uh, treatment on based on the cytological diagnosis. That's great. Thank you, Irina. Um, any other questions in the chat box there? Um, Alice? No, none that I can see. There's a lot of thank yous and great presentation. So. Okay, well, Sarah, I think you can just uh, imagine that hundreds of doors <laughs> yeah. from uh, 300. <laughs> Not just oh, the sorry, there's a new, oh, thanks a lot as well. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thanks, Alison. Okay. Okay, thank you. I am now going to um, stop sharing this screen, which will allow me to come out of this presentation and close it. And then I'm going to find the next presentation, which is going to be given by uh, Dr. Josephine Wright, who is SD5 in our department. And um, the EBUS team continues here, uh, as you will see. I will just start to share the screen with you now. So you should be able to see. Just to explain to uh, the participants, we are kind of in the early stages of developing our webinar platform and using Zoom. So that's why it may seem a little bit uh, amateur at the moment, but we are improving week on week. So um, thank you for that. So, okay, thank you, Josephine. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to present a further case of EBUS tPNA on a station 4L lymph node. So just a background clinical history of the case. The case is that of a 76 year old gentleman who presented with a six week history of hemoptysis. His past medical history included atrial fibrillation, peripheral vascular disease, hypercholesterolemia and a duodenal ulcer. A more recent uh, CT PA, uh, due to the uh, hemoptysis, showed a left upper lobe mixed solid and ground glass consolidation, and he had an enhancing 0.82 millimeter station 4L lymph node. So he progressed on to have um, the EBUS tBNA. So uh, similar to Claire's presentation, what I'm going to do is show you the direct smear hemocolor um, uh, slides, and um, I'm just going to show four images, and then we'll have an interactive question coming up as to how you would manage the rapid on-site evaluation at this stage. So I'm just starting with the low power view of the hemocolor direct spread. Okay, and we have our first question. So I'm just going to launch the poll for the first question. You can see the, um, the PowerPoint slide, but I'm going to move on to Joe's questions in the form of a poll now. I've just launched it, so you should be able to vote now. And uh, yep, can, 
get those fingers clicking away. Excellent. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, we're getting there. Almost half of you are watered already. And we're getting a nice spread of, um, uh, you know, interpretations there, which is always a good thing to see um, if there are different points of view, different opinions on a rapid on-site evaluation. So almost two thirds of you have voted now. If the voting is nearly complete, then I might stop and end the poll. Oops, I think that's in edit mode. So I think I've artificially created a scratch across your slide, I apologize. <laughs> so I'm going to <laughs> end the poll and I'm going to now share the results. There we go. Okay, so the correct answer was to undertake more passes for ancillary testing. We have a malignant cytology. What I'm going to do now is show you um, further PAP images. Um, and the, the question following this will be what you think your provisional diagnosis will be. Excellent. So, um, okay. So just stop for now, right? Okay. The PAP. Okay. So um, we have the first PAP image, uh, low power. Uh, the next image, slightly higher power, focusing in on the cells. Okay, so on to the second question, what is your provisional diagnosis? <laughs> Hope I haven't given the game away, but uh, there's just a flash there. Poll. So this is poll two and launching the poll for the second question. So how has the PAP further added information to your interpretation? Great, there's a nice spread of answers coming through, which is always interesting. Excellent. Okay, just over two thirds of you have now finished polling. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to end the poll and uh, share the results. There you go. Okay, so the correct answer was metastatic, poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. We'll go on to discuss this in more detail. Those of you that said metastatic non-small cell lung carcinoma were not entirely wrong. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's an important yeah. message at this stage. Very good. So I will stop sharing and I will close that slide. Okay, so following on from that, um, we undertook a cell block and here you can see um, the malignant tumor cells and you can see that the cells are enlarged they have prominent and multiple nucleoli and there's a lack of um, keratinization we then undertook um, further targeted immunocytochemistry and so this is our ttf1 stain which shows positive uh, nuclear positivity negative p40 stain and then we undertook um, further uh, testing for PDL1, ALK, and ROS1. So in this case, the PDL1 expression was strongly positive. And uh, I just show the picture of this on the left hand side. As you recall, that uh, in order to assess the PDL1, we must have more than 100 tumor cells, and greater than 50% of the tumor cells should show membranous expression. I haven't shown, but both the ALK and the ROS1 were negative. Patient went on to have next generation sequencing and no variants with established therapeutic or prognostic implications were detected in EGFR, KRAS, NRAS or BRAF. So obviously the patient would be then unlikely to benefit from treatment with EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors. What was interesting was the patient had an uh, equivocal RET rearrangement by FISH analysis and currently is undergoing further RET RNA sequencing regarding this. So, what was our final diagnosis? So our final diagnosis was metastatic poorly differentiated lung adenocarcinoma, which was TTF1 positive. 
it was strongly positive for PDL1 and negative for both ALK and ROS. I do apologize for the typographical error. There was an equivocal RET rearrangement and further RET RNA sequencing is currently underway. Current radiological stage was T1B and 2M1C. And a patient has recently been seen in the oncologist clinic. Um, he's having single agent treatment with anti pdl one um, monoclonal antibody. And he's currently receiving radiotherapy to the L1 metastases. So just a few points for discussion. Um, I've just um, put up the tissue pathways for the um, ROSE rapid on-site evaluation. Um, and as I said, uh, we thought that uh, it was an adequate sample, but there was malignant cytology, so it's um, essential that more passes are taken for ancillary testing. As you all know, that there is good evidence that ROSE reduces the number of, um, number of mediastinal um, sampling in the context of malignant disease, allowing for shorter procedures and more efficient use of resources. Uh, just to briefly mention the WHO 2015 histological classification of lung sarcomatoid carcinomas, uh, these are a group of poorly differentiated non-small cell lung carcinomas which contain a component of sarcoma or sarcoma-like spindle and or giant cell differentiation. This is relevant in this case because some of the cells were really quite enlarged and pleomorphic. So as you may recall, pleomorphic carcinoma is a poorly differentiated non-small cell carcinoma, which may be an SCC adenocarcinoma or large cell carcinoma. And obviously on histology, you could then perhaps see the spindle or giant cell component, which should comprise at least 10% of the tumour. Um, also of relevance is giant cell carcinoma, which is composed entirely of giant cells and does not have specific patterns of either a squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma or large cell carcinoma. I've also briefly included a paper from review which just highlights that um, with pleomorphic carcinomas, the differential diagnosis does include metastases from biphasic tumours elsewhere, particularly mesothelioma and malarian tumours of the uh, gynecological tract. And, um, also with giant cell carcinoma, melanoma, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, histiocytic sarcoma, and pleomorphic undifferentiated sarcomas may come into the differential. Um, this article is from PLUS One um, and highlights, as in our case, a high PDL1 expression in pulmonary pleomorphic carcinoma can correlate with a parietal pleural invasion, and also a high PDL1 may predict poor prognosis. Um, I've just included um, some of my references here. Um, thank you very much for listening. If there's any further questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Josephine. And um, right, so. Okay, uh, so thank you, uh, Josephine. Ash, are you okay? I'm happy to do the questions. Yes, please, if you would, that'd be great. Yeah, okay. So there's a question as to why was the first pass inadequate? I don't think the first pass was inadequate. I think it was adequate, um, but we wanted to send further material for ancillary testing. So, um, yeah, I mean, once we have, uh, you know, enough material on, on the first slide, we would normally say we don't want to make any more slides. So, you know, the uh, BMS or the cytotechnologist who would be uh, present alongside uh, with the pathologist, uh, you know, we would have a conversation at that point with the clinician and with the BMS to say, okay, we've got a really good slide here. I don't think more cells on a slide are necessarily going to help me uh, make a diagnosis and take the diagnosis any further at this point. But we would always ask for further passes. And for our eBus cases, it is, you know, customary to do five or six passes from each target uh, and then put them into saline. So you don't make slides. You just have one pair of slides, one pap and games up, but you could have five to six uh, mm. washes, rinses, which is why you saw the amount of cellularity that we had in our cell blocks that enabled us to be able to do all the range of tests possible uh, on the material. Thank okay. You. Another question then, how much sample from cytology do you need for next generation sequencing? Very little, actually. <laughs> what you need are, is a, what you need really is ideally a sample that is not contaminated by benign elements. So what you uh, you know want is a pure t tumor cell population. Uh, if it is accompanied by a background population, then the tumor cells should be more than at least fifteen to twenty percent of the total. Uh, nuclear content of, of that sample. Um, having said that, there are 
of the chunks or there are you know times when we have samples where there isn't much material on the cell block uh, and then what we do is if we've got one or two good uh, direct smears whether they're the pap or the genes or slides we just send those to our molecular lab and they would scrape that material and do the next generation sequencing uh, on, on that um, slide. So um, actually, if you don't have enough material in the cell block, your cytology slide is still great. Uh, and you could do not only your um, uh, molecular uh, mutation analysis studies, but you could possibly also do your um, cyto, um, cytogenetics and fish for say RET or ALK or uh, ROSWA mm -hmm. on, on direct unstained slides as well. Good question. Okay. I think the next two questions are, are kind of related, so I'll read them both and then you might see whether you need to answer them separately. One sure. question is morphology is not exactly pointing towards adenocarcinoma. Why, why not call it metastatic uh, non-small cell lung cancer without IHC? And then the other question is, why was this called adenocarcinoma morphologically rather than non-small non cell lung cancer? Okay, well, um, so this was a really difficult case. In fact, I was the pathologist who attended uh, this particular, um, uh, you know, uh, on-site evaluation. And when I first looked at the cells, I literally just sort of swung, you know, swung around to the bronchoscopist and said, you know, this is really wild. It's a really pleomorphic tumor. It doesn't really look like, uh, you know, your average lung carcinoma. Is there something else that we need to consider? Um, and they were quite sure that there weren't any other, uh, you know, primaries. There was an obvious lung primary and lymphadenopathy. And the fact that there was so much nuclear pleomorphism there, you're absolutely right. I did actually say to them at the time, this doesn't look like your average uh, lung carcinoma. Uh, it could be a poorly differentiated carcinoma. It could be a melanoma. Uh, it might even be an anaplastic lymphoma. It is just so wild that I cannot, at the time of the on-site evaluation, uh, say that this is even a, a you know a lung primary and so we and then i mentioned that there were uh, very anaplastic cells that there were a lot of giant cells and that is why the whole question of whether it could be um, an anaplastic lung carcinoma or you know pleomorphic giant cell carcinoma of the uh, lung were raised so you're quite right it it wasn't um, uh, an on the spot diagnosis of an obvious uh, adenocarcinoma there was a long discussion that followed at epas for this case thank yeah. you Great, great. Okay, question. again, similar um, query, I think, but more specific. Did you only do P40 and TTF1, or did you include other markers? Yeah, so um, Josephine, would you like yeah. to start? And then yeah, so, yeah we did uh, <laughs> P40 and uh, TTF1. I have the slides. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we obviously we just focused our immunohistochemical uh, assessment, um, bearing in mind the advice that we were given from the clinicians and then the presence of this lung mass. Absolutely. And in fact, this would be my, uh, you know, sort of teaching point or learning point about this case. Obviously, you have the benefit of being in the bronchoscopy suite. And so that is the time for your MDM. Really, you've got all the information that you need at that, uh, at that time. You've got, you know, the patient is there, you, the notes are there, the physicians are there, all the scans, everything's there to have a detailed discussion around complex or unusual cases. Uh, also, my advice in terms of immunochemistry is if you see something unusual, you know, don't waste or exhaust your cell block or all your cells doing a very big immunopanel because what you're going to really need in the end is genetics and uh, cytogenetics and fish. So what you don't want to do is a very big panel to start with and then find that you've run out of cells. Uh, once you've concluded, because you might do a panel of 10 and it just comes back as TTF1 positive and your melanoma and lymphoma and all the other markers are negative, all of that is tissue that's wasted. So I would go for a conservative, you know, sort of two-step or three-step uh, panels in the very uh, poorly differentiated carcinomas, purely with the view of trying to conserve the tissue as far as possible for, uh, for genetics and cytogenetics. But it's a great question, you know, if you were uh, sort of in an exam situation and you were faced with this case and, you know, uh, you know, what would you do? Then I think it would not be remiss to say that, you know, obviously an EBUS is a procedure which is primarily geared for the diagnosis and staging of lung cancer. 
However, if the appearances are unusual, uh, there should be a clinical discussion and a wider panel in this case, perhaps to include um, metastatic carcinomas, melanoma or lymphoma uh, should also be considered. So yeah, it's a great, a, a great question. And it's the reason why we put this case in because it doesn't lend itself to an easy diagnosis based on the cytomorphology alone. Thank you. Okay. There is another couple of questions. Are we okay for time? Do you want to uh, yes, just yeah, finish them? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Two are kind of slightly related as well. So I'm going to ask these together as well. Um, there was one question, was there sar sarcomatoid uh, look? They didn't appreciate that. But there's also another question. Is there a difference in management between poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma and pleomorphic sarcomatoid carcinoma? All right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So yeah, again, great questions. You know, what is the relevance of making uh, a diagnosis of a, you know, an anaplastic lymphoma or a, a, a giant cell a, a carcinoma? And the fact is that as we saw in our case, and Josephine, do you want to say what was the most useful test that we did in this case, which yeah. really helped? So actually the most useful test was the PDL1 because the patient now is on anti pdl one therapy and that's what's going to make a difference to his quality of life over the next few months. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, some of these poorly differentiated lung carcinomas uh, are strongly PDL1 positive. This was almost 100% positive. And that is what's described in literature about these very pleomorphic uh, lung carcinomas that they may not uh, express uh, other types of uh, mutations for uh, tyrosine kinase inhibition but they do show a very strong uh, PDL1 status. And uh, so they would be very good candidates for immunotherapy. So uh, it did, the psychology and the EBUS did make a difference to uh, definitive clinical management. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That one um, did create a lot of discussion. So that was brilliant. Thank you, Josephine. So I think we'll move on now in the interest of time as well so that we can see yeah. some more of the cases. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So I'm just going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to, sorry, I have to sort of say it all out loud because otherwise I'll just do something. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody knows what I'm doing right or wrong. Okay. So I have now located the next presentation, which I am just about to open up. Hopefully you can see it. And I am about to share the screen uh, and the right presentation. I am going into the, do, 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 uh, here we go. I need to go into, slideshow mode. How do I make this go away? Okay, bear with me. I'm trying to just get this into. Ah, here we go. The curtains just lifted. Slideshow, play from start. And I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Justine Derner, who's the, the youngest and the most junior person who's presenting from my department today. Uh, she's uh, just started being as an SD2 and supervised by my colleague, consultant colleague, Dr. Anu Malotra. She is going to present to you a case of a spindle cell tumor. Justine. Thank you, Ash, for the opportunity to speak. Um, so as you said, I'm Justine, I'm one of the, the trainees in St. Thomas's, and I've got Anu next to me. Um, so uh, the current patient is a 57-year-old African male. He presented with an enlarged and painless left preauricular lymph node. And the clinicians were wondering, is it reactive? Is it um, neoplastic? And he had a history of um, multiple um, skin lesions on his legs. And he had a left leg um, lymphedema. And he was HIV negative. So let's start with no power on um, gene cells. So this is our FNA fine needle aspiration of the lymph node in the left preauricular um, area. And you can see that we've got a, a cellular cross cluster on a background of hemorrhage and lymphoid population. So we know we're in the lymph node. And this is another low power view and another cluster. Um, when you think, when you listen to the cytological features, think of what your differentials are. 
So a bit closer up, we can see that we have a spindle cell population and it's really clustered, the nuclei are overlapping each other. And you can see the nuclei better at the edges of the cluster. And you can see that they are ovoid, um, elongated, and um, they are, as I said, overlapping with each other. And another close-up shot, we have nuclei which have a smooth nuclear outline. Um, there's not much in the way of pleomorphism. They, they are a bit um, plump and a bit hyperchromatic, but other than that, not mild pleomorphism and cytoplasm is dense. And this is a, sorry, a pap stain. Um, again, smooth nuclear outline, dispersed chromatin, and then you've got the hemorrhage in the background. Another pap shot. And this is the inflammatory infiltrate. We've got plasma cells, we've got lymphocytes, and again, lots of hemorrhage. And this is a histocyte, which has engulfed red blood cells and hemosiderin. So uh, this is a summary of what we have seen. You've got clusters of spindle cells, minimal pleomorphism, and you've got lymphocytes and plasma, sites, uh, plasma cells in the background. And you've got um, histocytes, which have hemosiderin in them and a hemorrhagic background. Unfortunately, the cell block didn't have any cells that we could do confirmatory immunostaining on. So the advice, the advice to the clinical team was to repeat the FNA so that we could do confirmatory immunostaining. So based on what you've heard so far, what do you think the diagnosis is? Okay, so I'm now going to launch the poll. The first of two questions. For Justine, let me just, right. here we go, poll one, and I'm now launching the poll, and you are good to go for voting, very good. Excellent. Yes, we're getting a nice spread of uh, a rapid on-site evaluation, a virtual rapid on-site evaluation. This is telepathology, telecytology at work, isn't it really? It does work, doesn't it? There you go. Okay, here we go. So over 70% of you have now voted. So I will close the poll and I will now share the results. And Justine will give you the spread of diagnoses in this case. So 46% of you thought it was Kaposi sarcoma, followed by 27% of you thought it was a spindle cell hemangioma. And the correct diagnosis in this case was Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing the screen now and then the presentation will resume. I'm just going to, okay, so is there another question coming up? Right, okay. Okay, let's move forward using that. Here we go. And a follow-up question. Now that you know it's Kaposi sarcoma, if you could pick one immunostain to confirm that diagnosis, which one would you pick? Very good. So I'm launching the poll now for Justine's second question. And you should be able to see those options now on your screen. Very good, some rapid voting there. Gosh, that's a very fast work. Uh, we've reached 70% in like about 10 seconds. That is good, <laughs> keep going. No, 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 okay. I won't stop you, I won't stop you. We shall have our day. Here we go, okay. Almost 80% of you have now voted. I'm now going to end the poll and share the results. So as you can see, the vast majority of you have gone for HHB8, um, and we'll go into that a bit more. Um, the rest of them are stains that you would use in Kaposi, but HHB8 is your definitive um, stain. Excellent. I will stop sharing that screen and close that box, and we're back to be able to move forward. Here we go. Fabulous. So it's Kaposi sarcoma. Um, this patient had a history of Kaposi sarcoma and um, 
uh, and had previous um, biopsy. And so the current cytology case, um, the diagnosis was given as a spindle, spindle cell lesion consistent with metastatic Kaposi sarcoma. And this was based on our previous knowledge of the fact that you had Kaposi. So what is it? It's a vascular neoplasm and is caused by HHV, which infects the endothelial cells, which undergo altered lymphatic um, differentiation. And then it produces cytokines, which drive this angiogenesis. And the lesions can be found in multiple areas, skin, mucous membranes, the organs, lymph nodes, and it tends to be indolent and benign, but it can metastasize. So in our current case with um, the current patient, as you heard, he had the, the leg lesions, um, but he also had them in the oral pharynx and he had a lung nodule. And when it metastasizes, it can cause symptoms such as GI bleeding, bone pain, um, cough if it, if it was in the lung. Um, so he was asymptomatic with the oral pharynx and the lung lesions, so they were let alone and uh, the leg lesions gave him lymphedema. So this is his skin um, biopsy from 2012 and the skin surface is on your left and you can see that we have a spindle cell proliferation in the dermis um, or forming infiltrate, infiltrative channels which can be slit like or sieve like depending on how it's cut. And you can see on the right side of the screen is uh, an um, inflammatory infiltrate comprised of lymphocytes and plasma cells. So that's um, characteristic of Kaposi. And you can see it on here, but another um, um, feature of Kaposi is uh, extravated red blood cells, hemosiderin, and then histocytes that are mopping up uh, the hem hemosiderin and red blood cells. And a non-specific finding for Kaposi is um, hyaline globules, which stain pads um, and is diastase negative. And this stained diffusely and strongly positive for HHV8. Um, it's important to remember that it can be focal in early stages of the disease, um, but um, this was more diffuse. And it's important to um, differentiate um, Kaposi from angiosarcoma because they can mimic each other histologically and HHV would be the one stain that would tell them apart. CD31 was also um, strongly positive in this case. Um, CD34 was also done and it was positive in exactly the same way. Um, so it was positive for your vascular markers, CD31, CD34, ERG, D240, and in a subset of Kaposi, CD31 can be negative, but obviously in this case it was positive. And CD34 is um, a useful stain to use if you've got a skin lesion and you want to tell it apart from the matofibroma, which is CD34 negative. So when thinking about differentials of spindle cell lesions in, in general in cytology, you can categorize them into broad categories. Um, and I'll bring up the differentials you can think of. So granuloma, granulation tissue, um, vascular stasis. Um, in the vascular um, category, we obviously have Kaposi and angiosarcoma, as I mentioned, and then a couple of others, as you can see. Um, fibrohistiocytic, um, such as cellular fibrohistiocytoma. In smooth muscle, we have lyomyoma, lyomyosarcoma, um, schwannoma, neurofibroma, and PNST in the neural category. And then you have metastatic malignancy that have spindle forms such as melanoma, which is a great mimicker for anything. And you've also got spindle cell carcinoma and synovial sarcoma. So the epidemiology of Kaposi depends on which subtype it is. So you've got classic, which is more your elderly population from Africa, um, Central Africa, Mediterranean, Eastern European, and they tend to have lower limb lesions and it's clinically indolent generally but it can be associated with secondary malignancy. And then you have the um, endemic African um, subtype, again lower limb, they present with lower limb lesions but it's more children to middle-aged um, adults and it affects people from sub-Saharan Africa generally but it's not related to HIV and it can be aggressive if the lymph nodes are involved. And then you have the iatrogenic subtype, which is your um, 
transplant immunosuppressed um, category. And then you have AIDS associated uh, in the patients affected with HIV. And it's the most aggressive of all the subtypes. And it mostly affects the skin, but it can be disseminated. So our patient didn't have HIV and he hadn't had a transplant. So he could have been the classical endemic, but we couldn't possibly see. Um, there were three stages to Kaposi. You've got the initial patch stage, which progresses to plaque and then tumour. And it's in the earlier stage where you get the focal HHV8 positivity. In terms of treatment options, there's many treatment options. Um, and our current patient had many years of radiotherapy. And in the last couple of years, he's had two rounds of um, chemotherapy. And it's just an ongoing process of um, outpatient follow-up and monitoring of his lesions. Thank you, and we welcome any questions you have. That's Thank fantastic. You so much, Great job, Justine. Wonderful. And uh, uh, yes, Alison. I was just going to say, well done, Justine. Very well presented. Um, and I'm getting lots of comments to actually um, congratulate you on that and say thank you, Justine. Um, there's really, there's only one question and I think you've answered that and it was about um, the groups that are non-AIDS related, um, carpal and sarcoma. So, um, and like you said, it's probably in the classic or endemic African that your patient um, sits. So I think that's answered that. Um, also, um, just to say, very well presented and thanks for giving the lead in history. Otherwise, it would have been a tough one. Um, yeah, everything else is thank you and interesting presentation. I can't see any specific um, questions other than those that I've just mentioned. Thank you, Alison. Um, Ash, I would like to say that's very right, Alison. It, if we didn't have the right setting and the right history, then uh, although it looks very straightforward, but it could have been a very difficult diagnosis, given in the plethora of differentials, benign, malignant, very malignant. But we were, although the, this, this happened in the palpable clinic in our setting, we are lucky to have one clinic where a cytopathologist goes and does the FNA. I did it myself and I had the background history. Uh, so I didn't go ahead and do, did many passes because the patient was uncomfortable but um, I had the background of uh, history and biopsy I had already HHV8 positive lesion. So it was easy to submit. Uh, the diagnosis that was submitted was spindle cell lesion consistent with metastatic Kaposi uh, sarcoma, which in a normal unknown setting would have been very difficult diagnosis to make. Absolutely, but I think that is one of the great strengths of cytology that Absolutely. you don't need to yeah. sort of re-diagnose an entity uh, by having to do an excision or a biopsy. You know, it's a clinical uh, a, a subject and uh, the fact that you have direct patient contact and you have the opportunity to uh, have all the information available to you for making a diagnosis doesn't make it any easier a job. I think it just makes it clinically much more relevant because cytology is enough to be able to say that, yes, it is the same disease again and, and not a different one. So um, I think it's, it's a great case. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Now I go through the same motions again of uh, stop sharing and then I'm going to escape from that presentation, close it down and find my next presentation and bring that up. Okay, presentations opened and I am going to share the screen with you and I am going to uh, just let that, okay, and slideshow play from the start. My great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Mary Varia, consultant, urological pathologist and cytopathologist, just like me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ash. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary. So the next case is of a 55-year-old male patient that came into clinic with a new mass in his right axilla. A PET scan was done, which revealed this mass to be intensely avid. Shortly thereafter, the patient underwent an ultrasound assessment, which deemed this 1.2 centimeter 
know to be pathological under radiological criteria. The consultant radiologist then performed FNA aspirations under ultrasound guidance. And you can see here the nice needle path going into the node. The radiologist made two passes. The first pass was for the preparation of slides, one MGG air dried slide, and the next was for a pap stained alcohol thick slide. The second pass was kept for needle washings in case ancillary tests would be needed later. These are the low power views of the MGG and pap stained slides. And I'm sure you'll agree that this is a markedly cellular aspirate. And these are all malignant cells which are dissociated. They have eccentric nuclei and the malignant cells impart a plasmacytoid morphology. On higher power, you can see that some of the malignant cells were binucleate, but also multinucleate forms were present. The nuclei were pleomorphic with high NC ratio. And the pap stain shows these rather angry looking, striking, prominent eosinophilic nucleoli. In some cells, these nucleoli were single, in others, they were multiple. Occasional cells also showed nuclear pseudo inclusions. These are essentially cytological cytoplasmic invaginations that impart the appearance of a true nuclear inclusion. And by definition, these nuclear inclusion, inclusions should be larger than 50% of the nuclear diameter, should be well defined with a nice smooth rim, and the content of the inclusion should be the same as the cytoplasm. So to summarize the features, we had highly cellular preparations comprising singly dispersed malignant cells, which had a plasmacytoid morphology, prominent nucleoli, nuclear pseudo inclusions, with malignant cells in single forms, binucleate and occasionally multinucleate forms also. So with these features in mind, what would be your preferred diagnosis? So time to launch the poll now. Uh, here we go. And I am going to bring on Mary's first question and you should now be able to see the question. Yep, there are blue lines zipping across the screen. Okay, good, a nice spread there. About 60% of you have voted so far, but yep, there's more votes pouring in. We have just gone past about the 70% mark, so I'm going to now end the poll and I will share the results with you and with Mary. Thank you very much. Now I will come back to the polling results soon, but my differentials for this case were, shall I move that forward? Yes, please, thank you. So my differentials for this case were carcinoma, lymphoma, and melanoma. And I request a small panel to cover the three. A13 and MNF116 cytokeratin stains to cover carcinoma, CD45 and CD30 to cover lymphoma, and three stains to cover melanoma, S100, Milan A, and HMV45. And so the tumor staining profile is as follows. The cytokeratins were both negative, the lymphoma markers were negative, However, the three melanoma stains were diffusely and strongly positive. And 71% of you had guessed correctly that the morphological features were that of melanoma and the immunohistochemical stains confirmed it. So this patient had metastatic melanoma in his right axillary lymph nodes. So the cytomorphological features of melanoma are, these aspirates tend to be rather cellular, Malignant cells are discohesive with pleomorphic nuclei, high NC ratio, with binucleate and multinucleate forms. As we know, melanoma is a great mimicker. It can vary in its morphology with plasmacytoid forms, spindle cell forms, and epithelioid forms. Melanin pigment, when present, can be very useful. These would be dark brown to black, quite granular pigment, which is 
either intracellular or extracellular. But we must remember that not all melanomas are pigmented, so we may have um, no pigment seen. Nuclear pseudo inclusions are seen in about 20% of melanomas, and again, they're very useful when you can spot them because they're only seen in a few tumors. Um, we can see them in melanomas, but also papillary thyroid carcinomas and meningiomas. And again, the melanoma cells tend to have rather angry looking prominent nucleoli, which is also helpful. When I come across a case with these features, the differentials I have in mind are high grade lymphoma, mainly because the malignant cells are dissociated. Hodgkin's lymphoma, because the multinucleate and the binucleate forms may mimic Reed Sternberg cells poorly differentiated carcinoma. And if the tumor cells comprise either spindled or epithelioid forms, I do think of sarcoma as well. The three stains which I find very useful for melanoma are S100, Milan A and HMB45. Of the three, S100 is the most sensitive, approximately 96 to 100% of tumors that are melanomas will stain positive for S100. But unfortunately, this is the least specific of the strains. Milan A and HMB45 are equally specific, but Milan A is slightly more sensitive than HMB45. Right, now that we know that the patient has melanoma, what further tests could you do to help him further? So this is the time to launch. Uh, Here's some uh, chat there. Sorry, I think somebody's unmuted, but don't worry, it's, it's all good. All right, I am now just looking for Mary's poll two, and I'm just launching the poll now, so you should be able to see the question. I'm not really know. Can I ask people to please turn the micro uh, microphones off, please? Okay. Uh, we've just, we just go across the two-third mark for uh, voting, so I am about to close the poll now and then share the results. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, we can. So we can stop, stop sharing and take the discussion forward. So we can still hear some people talking in the background. Perhaps you've forgotten to mute your microphones. Uh, please take a moment to check your microphone is muted. Thank you. Yes, 90% of the correct in that BRAF testing would be the most useful for this patient and some diagnostic material reserved for that purpose. And why is BRAF so important? In because approximately 50% of advanced melanomas harbor a mutation in the BRAF gene. And of the 50%, 97% of these mutations are located in codon 600, with V valine being substituted for E, which is glutamate. And patients with these mutations will receive targeted therapy with BRAF and MEK inhibitors which shows significant long-term treatment benefits in these patients. So molecular testing for BRAF actually helps to guide the treatment in these patients. Now I do have a confession to make. This patient has a vast extensive history, which I didn't tell you about earlier because that would have given the game away. But our patient actually presented four years ago with a primary malignant melanoma of his left abdomen. Seven months later, he developed lymph node metastasis on the ipsilateral side which was picked up on PET and again confirmed with ultrasound guided FNA. A month later, he was treated with therapeutic lymph node dissection, which showed six out of 36 node, the nodes which were positive for metastasis. He's actually BRAF mutation negative, so it's wild type. He didn't receive the BRAF targeted therapy, but he received combination immunotherapy. And he showed an almost complete response, but unfortunately he had to discontinue just before his fourth cycle due to toxicity of the drugs. These were liver toxicity and colitis, which required admission, myositis and arthralgia. Four years later, he developed metastasis in the contralateral axillary nodes, which is the case that we saw today. 
And in August, he was treated again with axillary nodal clearance, which showed one positive node after 23. The patient is doing well, but he is developing fluid under his surgical scars. And the clinical team have recommended the use of compression stockings for him on the right arm. And if that doesn't help, then he's going to be referred to the lymphedema service. And again, the discussions are ongoing about the possibility of a single agent immunotherapy as being used as adjuvant therapy for this patient. But again, the patient is aware that there might be a risk of recurrent toxicity with this type of treatment. So that's where we are today with this patient. I hope this case has been interesting and useful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mary. Alison. And thank you, Mary. Yep, again, a very interesting case and well presented. Um, I have a couple of questions coming in now. Sorry, let me just find these. Why was melanoma not considered as a differential diagnosis based on the initial morphology? Oh, sorry, myeloma, sorry. Why was myeloma not considered as a differential diagnosis based on the initial morphology? Because I felt that the tumor, tumor cells looked plasmacytoid rather than being plasma cells. They were quite large and there were large multinucleate forms with prominent nucleoli and pseudo inclusions which we wouldn't see with myeloma. And also I had the extensive history of his melanoma. Yeah. Uh, fair okay. enough. I, I think yeah. it's a, a fair question to ask, you know, why uh, you know, a plasma plastic type of myeloma might not look like that. But, you know, it has to, uh, usually when myeloma presents as a metastasis, again, you would A, often have that sort of background history for you to consider it. I would, uh, I have certainly been challenged by a very unusual looking plasma plastic myeloma, where, which presented for the first time uh, on the setting of a background of a urothelial cancer, and it had plasmacytoid cells. And I think it's a great point that you raise here that when we talk about plasmacytoid cells, remember the most plasmacytoid looking cells are plasma cells, but uh, you, it's so rare to come across plasmacytomas or myeloma uh, cases in an FNA practice that it kind of is lower down on your list of differentials unless there is uh, uh, some sort of a clinical pointer about it. Uh, Yurina, do you have yeah, any comment so, as a um, hematopathologist? Yeah, coming from a hematopathologist, obviously, when you're thinking about plastic cell neoplasm, the first is they're predominantly involved with bone marrow. So um, plasma cell neoplasm, like a plasma cell myeloma, involving the lymph nodes are very rare. So if it, it does occur, um, but I think it could be sort of lower down on your differential diagnosis. I think, you know, your top differentials should be what Mary has mentioned. Obviously, if all of those markers uh, are negative, then yes. Yeah, one thing to consider is this: is this um, a plasma cell neoplasm showing, as uh, Ash said, very quite immature features. If you search, um, if you have these sort of uh, enlargement of the nuclei, prominent nucleoli, quite dispersed nuclear chromatin, so um, immature plasmoblastic features. But again, lowest on lower, <laughs> one of the lower yeah. ones on your differential diagnosis yeah. list. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. I have another question here. What was the repeat BRAF results? It was again negative. Okay. See, would it be uncommon to see myeloma in a lymph node? I think we've probably answered that one. Yep. Um, so I think that's it. Again, lots of thank you. Great presentation. Fantastic fourth case study. Thank so you. Lots of positive feedback there. So. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. One of, one of yeah. the points I was going to make about uh, such a case is also that it is uh, very helpful, very useful to have seen a range of appearances of melanoma, uh, you know, in recurrent and metastatic locations where the history is available because it helps build your experience and expertise and being able to recognize it with confidence when it presents unexpectedly. And I think that is the real value of being able to recognize or think of a melanoma when it's occurring in the background as malignancy of the second malignancy. So the number of times we have patients who have a second malignancy uh, simply as a result of their investigations uh, and, and uh, incidental findings in the course of investigations for another cancer, 
that you discover a second cancer. And at that time, you've not considered it in your differential, you might miss it completely. And it does happen in, in reality. Carcinomas can be uh, called melanomas and vice versa. A lot of the dermatology uh, clinics and our uh, St. John's Dermatopathology Service really sees a lot of cases which have been called uh, you know, squamous cell carcinomas because the patients had a, an underlying skin disorder and a history of multiple skin cancers. Uh, and then they also went on to develop a melanoma and it was called you know, carcinoma for quite a long time. So uh, that is the value. And I think particularly for the trainees, uh, it is quite helpful for them. I yeah, think to, when they, you see a poorly differentiated tumor uh, without the clinical history of a melanoma to keep it in your differential, it would not be unreasonable uh, as Mary presented to you. Uh, obviously, you know, this is, she's presenting it as a teaching case to you. So, uh, you know, she has uh, deliberately kept in the differentials there of carcinoma and other poorly differentiated uh, uh, malignancies just to be able to uh, you know, stimulate you to, to think and keep those in mind when you come across that either in an exam situation or in a clinically unexpected situation. And in those cases, it becomes particularly helpful to, uh, to sort of convince the clinicians to say, well, actually, you know, we've discovered this melanoma uh, in the context of somebody with an existing squamous cell carcinoma but we have done the immunostains to prove that it is indeed melanoma, not just a poorly differentiated carcinoma. So it, it gives the, uh, the clinician additional sort of confidence that uh, you have uh, not only made an unexpected diagnosis, but you've also taken the additional steps to prove it and perhaps also prompted uh, you know, genetic testing through, through uh, BRAF mutation analysis. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No, lots of comments. Great presentations. Thank you for your great presentation. Thanks, everyone, for wonderful presentations. Thank you. There's no Thank other you. questions that I can see at the moment. Um, okay. Is that the final presentation, Ash? Well, with regret, I have to tell you that uh, our last presenter is unable to make it uh, okay. because she's not feeling well, and she promised to give it her best shot to try and be here in time for the presentation, but the fact is that she isn't here. And so perhaps we'll save that up for another time. But I would just like to take this uh, opportunity uh, to perhaps speak to all of you who are uh, attending the uh, conference today for you know, thinking about doing something similar from your department. It is much easier if you have you know, uh, a team working in the same place simply because of the mechanics of uh, you know, running a, a webinar. If you have multiple speakers and presenters from different sites, then of course the kind of chances of IT complications kind of multiply exponentially. But if you're all giving a presentation from the same room, from the same uh, laptop, uh, and you've just got somebody sort of uh, co-hosting uh, it on your behalf, it becomes relatively easy. Also, it gives you know, an amazing platform for our uh, colleagues, both junior and senior, to present you know, the cross-section of uh, cases that we um, have in our clinical practice. And it is uh, less onerous for just one individual to do you know, five or six case presentations. Uh, and these are all individual cases that they have you know, diagnosed. So they've had a direct sort of part to play in it and therefore they can present it much more convincingly. So it's just a formula perhaps for all of you to think about and feel free to email the BAC, feel free to flood Christian Burt's and Allison's inboxes with requests <laughs> to want to volunteer and present uh, cases online. I think we've uh, really put digital cytology to the test in the last few months. We've seen how confidently people are able to vote on images, uh, you know, which they've only seen for a matter of seconds. So clearly digital uh, pathology and digital cytology especially is something that comes uh, with practice and you, it just gets better with time. So we do want to promote its use. We want to uh, ask you to volunteer uh, to present maybe a range of cases from your departments so that we can continue to have uh, uh, such webinars uh, throughout the year. Thanks. Exactly. Um, a question just come in about how can people access the recording? We'll actually work on that and then we'll um, either send out emails or we'll post something on the BAC website. So um, we will try and make that contact with you with regard to where we're posting the recording. Okay, okay. so okay. if there's no other questions, um,
questions. I would like to thank all four of our presenters for um, great um, cases today, very interesting, stimulated some discussion. And again, brilliant presentations. The images were fantastic. So I thought they were brilliant. Um, and we look forward to many more webinars coming up. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Much. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Ash, I don't know if you want to put host over to Christian again now. Yep. Okay. I will. I can tell you I'm the most relieved out of all the speakers because if there's <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who could really get things wrong this afternoon, it was me. And so my amateur attempts <laughs> at hosting a webinar. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all so no, much. No, that was brilliant. Thank you, everybody. And there's lots of thank yous and, and positive feedback coming through on the chat still. So, And there's also some best wishes for your colleague as well. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that means the world to us. Thank you all so much. Okay, I am now going into participants and I so should I hold um hand the control make Christian the Christian. host the BAC office the host office. okay make host well that's a goodbye from me I think thank you bye change of host thank you Ash. <laughs> bye bye thank you Ash that was brilliant well done thank you thank thanks you. everyone thanks thank you and I've saved all the chat as well for our feedback brilliant so yeah that we could probably start there. recording now though Absolutely. Make a really nice Christmas card, I reckon. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, cheerio, yeah. everybody. Bye -bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.